Hello, Internet, and welcome to another episode of That's All I Have to Say About That. As always, I'm your host, Stephen Mackey. Today we're talking about China and cars, one of the only manufacturing markets China is yet to dominate. Alright, so we've heard of Toyota and Chevy, but I am yet to see someone driving around in a Dongfen truck. So what is China doing about that? Are they going to sit back and just let someone else have this one? Heck no, they're limiting their imports, but in a very different way than America's approach to the issue. Donald Trump doubled down on his hardline protectionist trade policies Tuesday, breaking from the traditional Republican platform and threatening to shut down America's free trade agreements. In Trump's world, the way to limit competition for domestic production is to increase import costs. Well, China is taking a different approach. Green technology has long been in the slow lane in China, but it now seems to recognize the need to reduce its fast-growing dependence on crude oil and to limit its choking emission. Now, you might be hearing all this as an environmental message, and believe me, it is. But China is using a different method to foster their own automobile industry, weaponizing environmental standards. You see, while American car brands have been more focused on grit and whether you can tow a fully grown sequoia strapped to the back of your car down a snowy mountain road, China has been a little bit more focused on different aspects of cars. China is already the biggest auto market in the world and without a doubt it will be the biggest market for electric vehicles. We think it's very good that in such a fast growing market the Chinese government has provided guidance and incentives through its policies. So what are those guidance and incentives? There's one sinister method they're using, but sinister in the way that it'll save the environment and subsequently all of us. In 2019, China is going to put in a quota for companies making or importing more than 30,000 non-electric cars into the country to create imports of 10% electric cars by 2019 and 12% electric cars by 2020. Now whoop de doo you might be saying to yourself, just import more electric cars. Well, large car makers are having a little bit of a problem with that because while electric cars can get you from point A to point B, can they go from zero to illegal in three seconds? For all those times you get caught in an impromptu drag race or car chase. The solution most companies are taking is building electric cars in China using Chinese manufacturing so that they can import their cars. Volkswagen recently invested $10 billion into local Chinese partners to build new electric vehicle models, while Toyota announced that they're going to begin their own production of electric vehicles in China by 2020. This led to electric reporting, GM is going green, but only in China. And those cars are about as likely to be made in America as a 99 cent finger trap. In fact, if you're wondering which brand is getting the electric treatment, is it the Escalade or maybe the Malibu? Nope, it's the Baojun, a car that was contracted out and created by a Chinese company, Wu Ling. This strategy is clearly doing something right and is even being copied by India. The government's drive to make India a 100% electric vehicle nation by 2013 has caught the fancy of many state governments. Ha! China, now you know what it's like to have someone steal your good ideas. India is going to try and go full electric by 2030. Good for them. Now, for reference, let's see how the US is doing. President Trump will announce that uh, his administration is reversing what the Obama administration locked in towards the end of the term in January, and those are the fuel economy standards from 2022 to 2025. Great. So now I want to examine the economic implications of what China and India are attempting to do versus what Trump's trade strategies attempt to do. Now Trump is not exactly pro-free trade, and his strategy for increasing jobs in America is through increasing tariffs. I think we'll say that's fine. If the labor's cheaper over there, that's good. But you know what? You're going to have to pay a tax to get the cars back in. You're going to have to pay a penalty. And if you put a, a penalty on, a tariff or whatever you call it... Yeah, sorry to cut it off, but he gets really distracted after that. That is his way of protecting our auto industry though, with Reuters reporting that Trump was threatening Germany with 35% US import tariffs, and Trump's expressing desires to start taxing automobile imports from Mexico. Man, how the politicians can change their mind quickly. 
With the multi-billion dollar auto bailout package still on the political assembly line, opponents on Capitol Hill are railing against what they call a taxpayer-funded travesty. Unless Chrysler, Ford, and General Motors become lean and innovative and competitive in the marketplace, this is only delaying their funeral. The conversation seems to have transitioned from letting the automakers fail because of a lack of domestic innovation to let's violate more treaties than the German invasion of Poland by abandoning free trade in order to keep our auto industry afloat. Now, before I start talking about the negatives of using tariffs to control supply, let's talk about the positives. Here's noted Russian propaganda channel RT, who seem to, for whatever reason, love Trump's tariff programs. Tariffs and subsidies, sure. subsidies for domestic industries, mm -hmm. tariffs against foreign imports. Exactly. And, and that funded the federal government, the entire government, sure. from 1793 until the Civil War, 100%. That's right. It funded mm -hmm. two thirds of the federal government all the way up to World War I. And after the Civil War, that system of trade protection created the greatest industrial and technological powerhouse that the world had ever seen. So should we just go back to what Alexander Hamilton and George Washington invented that worked so well for almost 200 years? I gotta tell you, I'm really digging what he's selling. Increase government revenue and protect American jobs? Where do I sign up? Now, while all of these are good arguments, contemporary economics sees three problems with tariffs. First, there's the golden rule. You know, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Turns out that if you make it super expensive for people to sell in your country, they're not just going to maintain business as usual, they're going to make it super expensive for you to do business with them as well. Now this just increases inefficiencies in the market and lowers the amount of product a company can sell. Secondly, we have prices. Remember that Trump clip I played you earlier about tariffs? Well, he has an epiphany halfway through that rant. You know what? They're going to make cars here. And maybe a person will buy fewer cars over the course of a lifetime. Who cares? He's right. Who cares? Besides the people who make cars, of course. This concern is about falling demand because it was predicted that with Trump's tax on automobiles from Mexico, the price of small cars in the US would be raised by 20%. The last major problem is innovation. If you take away foreign competition in foreign markets as well as domestic regulations on quality and improvement, you're going to end up with some of the best cars since the Pinto, a car that doubles in value when you fill the tank. I mention these problems because whether you think tariffs work or not, I think China's method effectively accomplishes the same goal as tariffs while avoiding the problems. First, we have the golden rule. If other nations like India push for more electric cars to be sold than gas cars, well, that's not really a problem. The only problem would be if a nation pushed for the sale of inefficient cars. In just the past year, autos surpassed power plants as the largest contributors to U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. But U.S. President Donald Trump wants to give automakers more time to meet stringent standards which were created under former President Barack Obama. Today I am announcing that we are going to cancel that executive action. Okay, so it's not unbelievable that some nations might do that. That also kind of checks out for the nation that, after extensive market research, Japan's Subaru Ascent released in the US with 19 cup holders, or 2.5 cup holders per person. Second, we have prices. Now this one's a little more tricky because when looking at the new Tesla that costs more than your house, okay, if it's either that or walking, I'm going to invest in some good running shoes. But new innovations have made really cheap electric cars in China, specifically, a car that's $5,000 after government incentive programs are applied? And that's GM! Oh man, next time this guy talks to real people, not actors, can one of them please tell him this is what we want? As impressed as we are with your JD Power initial quality award that you bring up like a guy who peaked in high school brings up his game winning touchdown, I don't want to hear from you until you have a JD Power lasting quality award or this car. Lastly, we have innovation. This system encourages innovation by bringing in high quality competition. It forces manufacturers of high technology and efficiency cars to compete on price and quality, rather than just reverting back to old and cheap technology. 
While tariffs have an undisputable positive and negative effect, I feel like the Chinese and subsequently the Indians have found a way to improve our old protectionist paradigm. And I would like to see quality based importing systems enter the conversation in more ways than just regarding immigrants. Thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I hope you enjoyed that last video. For more episodes of that's all I have to say about that, click here. And click here to subscribe, like below, and if you're really a fan you can join our Facebook group. It's just a party over there.